Thanks, Elizabeth. It's great to have Elizabeth back for this summer as our uh, from Florida State University School of Music. Go Noles! Go Noles! Sorry, Florida grad. Um, you had to, you had to be somewhere. <laughs> anyway, good morning. My name is John. I'm the pastor here at South Shore. I first wanted to say thank you for coming to church today. Thank you for being here as summer is approaching and all the manner of, of life can sometimes overwhelm us. And uh, sadly, and I know how it is, that sometimes Sunday morning is the first place to leave us in our discipline. <laughs> and it's a great day to sleep in and all of that. And uh, I don't know, maybe you did sleep in because this is the 11 o'clock service, but uh, I'll give you credit anyway for coming, and it's always great to have some of our students uh, playing and singing and, and all of that, so um, anyway, thank you guys for your service, for your leadership, and, and the guys in the back, and, and all that you do to make this a great place to worship God, to grow in faith, and not to build a church, because that's not our point but to together become an engine that makes disciples for Jesus Christ 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's who we are together. And we come together on Sundays to be empowered, to be enriched, to learn a little bit, to fellowship together, to be refueled so that we can go out and continue to function as that engine for God, where we are sold out where we are sure that this is a good place to put all of our effort, our energy, our time. If we're going to bet on something, we bet on God. Sadly, it's not who we are. Most of the time, or at least I, I experience myself and as I experience people in the western world and here in the United States and in Riverview, Florida and the South Shore area, we do invest in God, but we also invest in some other places. Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but I don't know if God has a 401k plan. <laughs> and so I want to save what I can, and I'm going to put it in this nest egg because one day I'm going to retire, and I, you know, want to go and move somewhere else and play golf with all the other unhappy people. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Really, uh, my parents would move to Sun City Center from Ruskin. It's a whopping like six miles. But um, <laughs> anyway, it's a great place, West Sun City, Sun City Center. And if I could live there and play golf every day, I would do it. But I'm not old enough yet. And, um, you know, um, my wife would do either. But one day, I'm going to make it there. Uh, we tend to try to balance the way in which we live our lives. And we tend to look in lots of different places for happiness and for joy. Uh, sometimes those are in places that are largely good places for us to look for them in the lives of uh, our family, those with whom we choose to live, like maybe if we have children or grandchildren, then, then we look for happiness and joy inside of that. And that's not a bad thing to do. Uh, sometimes we can look for joy and reward inside of our uh, chosen profession and the thing that we choose to do is our, our calling in life to, to make money. And that, that can be a very noble and good thing to do, particularly those of us in our service uh, industries. And, and I know we celebrated uh, those who, who served in the military last week. And those are good, kind of cool places to be. You see, the thing that's difficult for us is that scripturally, God's very clear. Everything, everything else is number two. There is only one number one. There are not seven number ones. There are not equal divisions that we can put in all of these places and have a balanced portfolio of the way in which we live our life. There is one thing. Love God. Love your name. And all that other stuff comes second. Not that it's bad. It just can't be number one. Because you see, the love of God... God's redemptive power in our lives is what enables us to love those other things anyway. It's what enables us to be the kind of dad, husband, friend, son, daughter that we have been called to be. You can't love your neighbor until you love God first and God fills you up and heals your brokenness. It's just the way it is. 
So we had the opportunity this summer to address that, we address that today, and from maybe a little bit of an unusual place. We're going to look at the Old Testament for a few weeks, and we're in the book of First Kings uh, today, and we are, look, listen, I believe it's chapter 18, for those of you who want to look it up in, in your Bible, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit as we go through, and I want to tell you the story of Elijah. Now, Elijah is a prophet of God, and at this point in, in understanding who Elijah is, he is the lone surviving prophet of Yahweh, uh, the God of Israel, the God of Isaac and Jacob, the God that we know and worship. All of his uh, other, all the other prophets have been hunted down and killed by King Ahab at the behest of Jezebel. Now, you may, for those of you who don't know the character of Jezebel, you may have heard people refer offhandingly to a woman uh, who is. <coughs> A manipulator who twists things and connives and gets her way, maybe even in a way in which that is uh, sexual in nature. You know, a Jezebel. You have to say it with a southern accent. You know, she's a Jezebel. Are you with me? Yeah. For those of you who saw The Water Boy, you know what I'm talking about. into 1 
virtually the lion's den and says, hey, what's up? <laughs> and Ahab's like, oh, it's you. <laughs> you know, like revenge is at hand. And he calls him a troublemaker. And Elijah, you would think, would have some sort of sense about him and try to, you know, work the situation. But instead, he goes, oh, no. It's not I who has caused trouble in Israel, but you and your government. You dumped God's ways and commands and run off after the local gods, the balls. Can you imagine infidel? Can you imagine rising up? Can you imagine the shock in the courts as this wild person, Elijah, who's been living in poverty for years, comes out of the forest and basically comes and calls the king on the carpet? I bet Jezebel was freaking out. <laughs> and then he doesn't stop there. Elijah now commands the king what he's supposed to do. Assemble everyone in Israel at Mount Carmel and make sure the special pets of Jezebel, the 450 prophets of the local gods, the Baals, and the 400 prophets of the whore goddess Asherah are there. Okay, you get what's going on here? Elijah just didn't walk in and go, yes, king. Hello, king. I have a word from Yahweh. Please don't kill me. I just want to find out. He walks in and he goes, listen, dude, you messed up big time. So you get those prophets. And even those who worship that core goddess. It's time. Life is pretty bad, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's well, wouldn't you be? He's not going there on his own accord. Elijah isn't going on and going, you know, I have a good idea. I'm going to go do a personal affront in front of everybody to the king and put my life on the line. I think that sounds like a great idea. As soon as I finish my bowl of Cheerios, I'm going to go, no. God has commanded him, and he's been obedient. And so he walks into this court with the confidence of the prophet of Yahweh. And that's a big deal. I was watching uh, a little bit of TV this morning as I was getting ready, and a commercial came on. And there's a big anti-bullying campaign. I know you've probably seen some of the commercials. And in this commercial, it says these events actually happen. And it's uh, a video of, of a kid on the bus. And the kid's getting punched and shoved and ordered around by two or three kids. And as the camera pans around, you see all these other kids kind of going, not knowing what to do, simply sitting there being silent. And you know, as an adult, I remember my life perfectly. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, I remember when I was in middle school, I had stood up to those bullies and I said, hey, you bully, quit that. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I sat silent and watched that stuff go on. In fact, sometimes I jumped in on it and participated. And sometimes I was the person getting ordered around. Sounds good and easy when we're not in the middle of a situation to have the voice of what is right. You know, I think we've been running into it today. <coughs> Standing around the water cooler, some of the conversation that can happen. We know it's wrong. And sometimes we walk away and feel like that's the best thing that we could do. When maybe, we just need to be. The words of the Holy Spirit are churning inside of us. And not in a judgmental and, and ugly, let me tell you what's right here, but in the beautiful discernment of the Holy Spirit to respond with kindness. You shouldn't talk that way. Please stop. You know what I'm saying? I know it happens in the communities in which you live. I know it happens in the school system that our kids attend. And there are all manner of times that we straddle the fence. We hedge our bets and we worry about being in the court of whatever king happens to be ruling that moment. Standing up and saying what is right. Standing up for what God has placed in our heart. But it's hard to stand up when you've hedged your bet. It's hard to stand up when you bet on not only God and being present in church and learning about who he is and who he's called you to be, but also what you wore here today and what you think your clothes say about you. 
about what car you drive, about what neighborhood in which you live, about the people that you've chosen to align yourself with, whether that be a, a power bridge club in your community or whether it be in one of our poorer neighborhoods, a gang of people who rule their participants with violence. You see, all of those are placing our trust in something they can't deliver. Can your house hug you when you have a bad day? Can your car somehow respond to your tears as you sob on the way home because you hate your job and you're afraid to go home? That's who we become, at least sometimes. We invest in things that cannot be a blessing to us. And somehow, the twisted way in which the world has grabbed us tells us <coughs> that the jaguar is somehow going to make us happy. That if we could just live in the neighborhood across the street, we'd be happy. That if I could just lose that 20 pounds and look like that model at Abercrombie, they just put somebody else's head on my body just so you know. <laughs> but somehow, we'd be happy. And you know, even when we achieve those things, and we bought those cars, and we moved to those neighborhoods, and we lost that weight, still not Because the only thing that can calm our restless heart the redeemer, the creator, the forgiver, the one who has offered, offered your life. So let's get back to the lunch. He tells them to bring everybody to Mount Carmel, and so he comes and he gets everybody there, and Elijah challenges the people, how long are you going to sit on the fence, he asks. If God is the real God, follow him. If it's Baal, follow him. Would you just make up your minds? And here are the people of Israel. Uh, what? Because, you know, we remember what Yahweh did for us. We sing the song still. We, we practice what we're supposed to practice. But, you know, Jezebel and Ahab kind of killed all the prophets. And uh, we're just here trying to get some rain. So what's the big deal? Can't we bet on both things? So nobody says a word. Nobody makes a move. And I have to wonder, at the end of my sermon today, will that be what happens? Just ask. So Elijah says, I'm the only prophet of God left in Israel, and there are 450 prophets of Baal. So, let the, let the Baal prophets bring up two oxen. Let them pick one, butcher it, lay it out on an altar on firewood, but don't get it. I'll take the other ox, cut it up, and lay it on the wood, but neither will I light the fire. Then you pray to your gods, and I'll pray to God. The God who answers with fire will prove to be, in fact, God. And so all the people agreed. That's a pretty good idea. Yeah, because then we'll know who's going to win, and we know which, which one to bet on. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Good idea. So, Elijah tells the Baal prophets, choose your ox and prepare it. You go first, because you're in the majority. <coughs> then pray to your God, but remember, don't light the fire. So they took the ox he had given them, prepared it for the altar. They prayed to Baal, Baal and they prayed all morning long. Oh, Baal, answer us. But nothing happened. Not so much as even the whisper of a breeze. And so desperate, they begin to jump and stomp on the altar they had made. And by noon, Elijah starts making fun of them. <laughs> he taunts them and he goes, oh, could you call a little louder? He is a god after all. Maybe he's off meditating somewhere or other. Or maybe he's gotten involved in, a, in another project. I know. Maybe he's on vacation. <laughs> you don't suppose he's overslept, do you? <laughs> and that he needs to be waked up. So they prayed louder and louder, and they began to cut themselves with their swords and knives, which was a ritual that they would do, until they were covered with blood. And this went on until well past noon. And they used every religious trick and strategy they knew to make something happen on the altar, but nothing happened. 
not so much as a whisper, or even a flicker or a spark. So then Elijah tells the people, enough! It's my turn. So he gathers them around, and they, as they gather, he put the altar back together, because by now it's in the ruins. And Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes of Jacob, the same Jacob to whom God had said, From now on your name is Israel. And he built the stones into the altar, into the altar to honor God. And then Elijah dug a fairly wide trench around the altar. He laid firewood on the altar, cut up the ox, he put it on the wood, and said, Fill four buckets with water. Now, what were they doing for three years? Drought, drought. Take the thing that you're praying for. <laughs> Take the thing that you, that right now is more valuable than anything else in our entire land, and let's douse the altar with it. And then he tells them to do it again, and they do it again, and he says, now do it a third time, and they did it a third time, and the altar was completely drenched, and even the trench was filled with water. And when it was time for the sacrifice to be offered, Elijah the prophet came and prayed, O God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make it known right now that you are God of Israel, that I am your servant, and that I am doing what I am doing under your orders. Because I don't know about you, but this was a time right for a coup. Elijah could have probably done anything and could have been Instead, he places authority where it belongs with the God who called him. He places himself in the correct place as a servant, and then he's doing it under God's orders. And he continues to say, Answer me, God. Oh, answer me and reveal to this people that you are God, the true God, and that you are giving these people another chance at repentance. Now, I don't know about you, but it would be pretty dramatic and amazing, I think, if, and then inside of the wood, there was a spark. And then Elijah got around and began to fan it and blow on it and worked it into a fire until he got it going. And then eventually it came about, and that would be pretty cool, right? Because, I don't know about you, but that would fit with my theology because God needs my help. Because if something's really going to work in this church, you know I have to be behind it. <laughs> Standing in and blowing on it because, you know. <laughs> Where am I putting my trust? In, and that's not what Scripture says. Hear what Scripture says. Immediately, the fire of God fell and burned up the offering, the wood, the stones, the dirt, and even the water in the trench. That's, this is when people generally would shout amen and all that. Amen. Or a hoo-hoo. Yes. Yeah. This wasn't some little flame that kind of, oh God, show you our God. Bam! <laughs> there is no doubt. There is no. <laughs> it was, I ain't doing that. <laughs> God, wait, it's me and you all the time. It's me and you. It's me and you. All the time. I'm just messing around. It's just me. <laughs> that is the way in which God was revealed in this particular story. And all the people saw it happen, and here is their response. They fell on their faces in awed worship, exclaiming, God is the true God. God is the true God. Okay, so here we are, 2013. Involved in our 401ks, in our houses, in our cars, in our stuff. And guys, we are straddling the fence. We think we're doing the right thing. And I'm not begrudging you, because I do the same thing. I'm just inviting people to come to our church because we want to see the seats filled. Because we think that if we would just build a church, that that's what being faithful disciples is. And I'm here to tell you that's not the goal. The goal is not to build a church. The, the goal is not to get new church people. The goal is to make disciples who make disciples. The goal is for me today to so inspire you through preaching that you go out and do something. 
that you go out and say something, that you go out and invite and you tell people, I'm not hedging my bets anymore. I am not going to put my faith in stuff and in God to see which one's really going to make me happy. I'm going to choose today to follow God, to put him first so that I will choose to be last so I can be first, that I can be the servant so that all that other stuff can be added on to me because I've got to love God first if any of this is going to make a difference. That is the only way that we have credibility out in the world. The only way. It is about going all in. Now, some of us will be called to do what I do. Some of us will be called to be preachers and to be pastors. Some of us will be called to be teachers. Some of us will be called to be servants. Some of us will be called to make phone calls. Some will be called to play in the band. Some will be called to serve in the worship team. Some will be called to deliver food to people who need it. Some will be called to to be a voice of peace in the midst of chaos. But all of us are called. So what do we do? Now I'm not saying go and sell all your 401k and give 10% to the church, although that would be nice. <laughs> I'm saying and I'm not saying that your family is not important. And I'm not saying that having a nice house and living in a good neighborhood and all of that doesn't have value because it certainly does. But that can't be number one. Loving God. So that you can love others has to be first. And all too often, and myself included, straddle the fence, playing both sides. And sometimes, even me, when I'm asked the question, I do not. God help me. God help each of us. And so it's good that we are going to share communion today. And, and the way in which we want to engage it is this. The things that you have put equal with God or in front of God, that you will recognize that, you will own that, and you will repent for that. And then you will lay that temptation down at the foot of this altar, the foot of this cross, and that the elements of the bread and the juice will come and be for you the body and blood of Christ. That just like the holy fire that fell upon that sacrifice, God's holy fire will immediately fall upon you and will consume the things that you offer to God. So that those temptations and those things that are co-equal or compete with God in your life will exist no more. And that you can be empowered to be the person God has created you to be. Just like the son who came to his senses and went, what am I doing? I have sinned against God and before you, Father. I am. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home. Because <coughs> even my servants are treated, or God's servants are treated better than this. I'm going to go home fully expecting to be placed in a low Stature in the household, and what happens? God sees sees us. The father sees the repentant child and runs and greets him and hugs him and kisses him and puts a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, and a robe around him and reinstates him as a beloved child in the family. This is the faith that awaits you. When we come and place God first, we are exalted so that we can be just like Jesus be a servant to all. There is me. There is blessing. There is the joy that you see in hedging your bets. Is it time to go all in? Shall we pray together? Lord, we don't come to this table trusting in our own capacity, in our ability to fan the, 
the faith, the flame of faith ourselves, and that somehow it's up to our duty. But God, we trust completely in your righteousness, your power, in your ability to heal and to make new. Lord, we've done stuff we're not proud of. And as we reflect on it and remember it, it brings us grief. God, there are even things that we're unaware that we didn't do, and even knowing that we've fallen short, God, we, we have grief about that too. And so, Lord, we lay those things at your feet. And we trust in your righteousness and in your mercy. We're not worthy to gather up even the crumbs that, are, that fall from your table, and yet you invite us to be here anyway. So, Lord, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine, and may they be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. May they wash us new. May they empower us and feed our very souls. May your Holy Spirit be present in this act, and may we be different because we have, an, have had an encounter with the divine. Lord, in our doubt about what this moment could be, in our question of whether you're real and of whether this makes any sense at all, would you speak to each of us today? And may our desire to please you, please you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.